First topic of today is a third example of passive transport. And passive transport, you can kind of see, uh, passive transport is when there is no energy required to push a molecule across a membrane um, from high to low concentration. Simple diffusion is when molecules can go directly through in between these phosphate groups and the fatty acid tails. But some molecules that are too large or some molecules that have polarity to them, a charge, can't squeeze in between these portions of the phospholipid. So they need help, and that's where the term facilitated comes from. They need help across the membrane. They will move in whatever direction the high to low concentration would be. In this animation, it is from outside to inside to start, and then they kind of reverse it. So I'm going to do this without the, the, the text is on the bottom there, but I'm going to kind of do my own little interpretation of this. But we start, and we see that the um, outside of the cell is more highly concentrated than the inside of the cell. This is what they call a carrier protein. I have sometimes referred to them as integral proteins, but they're just any protein that goes between. It has to go the, the entire length of the phospholipid bilayer because it's got to go from one side to the other. So we continue, and you can see the movement is going to be from outside to inside because that's the high to low concentration. In this animation, there is a movement or change of shape in the protein. Not every single animation that I've seen has a configuration change, but there's that there's the change right there. And the molecule will then be spit into the other side of the membrane, and it will continue until equilibrium. And it can reverse as well, and you're going to see momentarily, look what happens. It's going to go, the inside of the cell now has the high concentration, and it will go on the flip to the outside of the cell. What type of molecules require facilitated fusion? As I mentioned, they are large molecules or they are polar molecules. A good example molecule that requires facilitated diffusion is glucose. When compared to molecules such as oxygen, O2, can that go right through C6H12O6, which is the molecular formula for the glucose molecule, is too large. There is no standard number that says above this number of atoms is large and below. It just, it's a very relative term. But glucose is a good example. Other examples might be amino acids. Remember, essential amino acids are those that you get from your diet. So how do they get into the ribosome where they need to be processed? They need to get in via these little channels. These channels are built specifically for the molecule that they help diffuse across. It's not a one-size-fits-all and lets anything in that it wants. This is, remember, selectively permeable. So this protein channel might be for glucose, and there might be other protein channels for amino acids, so on and so forth. All right. So that is the... Uh, a type of, and is a specific type of passive transport. The next type of passive transport that is very much um, really the same animation is called diffusion through ion channels. And some proteins are built for ions. So it's just a specific type of transport. So I'm not even going to change the animation because technically this would be the same exact thing. Instead of this being glucose, Ions, which could be very, very small in size, one atom in size, they have a charge. So examples might include chlorine. Chlorine as an ion is Cl with a negative charge. Then there are other examples such as sodium. Sodium has a positive charge when it's an ion, and potassium has a positive charge. These things have charges, so therefore they are polar. They cannot get through the membrane. They are stuck. So therefore they have ion channels that will work in the same direction, high to low. So in this case, if these were the sodium ions, they would be diffusing out the ion channel to the other side. So really, it's just semantics. It's just a very specific type of facilitated diffusion um, that you need to know. The next type of uh, transport we're going to talk about is one that actually requires energy. That facilitated diffusion and diffusion through ion channels kind of ends our talk on passive transport process. We're now going to talk about active transport processes. Active means you require energy. You require the energy because you're going from a low concentration to high concentration. Sometimes they say you're going against the concentration gradient. Sometimes they say you're going up the concentration gradient. So what we'll do is we're going to look at an example of active transport. And the first example that we will mention is what are known as pumps. The term pump indicates that you're using energy. So here is an example. It's a sodium-potassium pump. We just talked about sodium-potassium in ion channels. 
they will diffuse from high to low via these channels. They don't require energy. In a pump, we actually go from low to high. So this is requiring energy. So there is a, a, a protein embedded within the membrane, as you can see here. And what it does is it helps move sodium ions against their concentration gradient, simultaneously moving potassium ions against the concentration gradient. So it's a multi-step process, so I'm going to kind of pause it at what I believe are the different steps that I think are very important for you to recognize. In its original conformation or original shape, we can see that the protein channel is open to the inside of the cell. There are three positions for this shape, which you can see these are going to be designated for the sodium, whereas the right-hand side has two positions available for the shape of their potassium. As the molecule is open to the inside. What's going to happen? The sodium ions, three of them, three of them at a time, bind into this pump. When there is no energy available, this is the open, this is how it's open to the inside of the cell. If I want to change the conformation, I require energy. Energy is needed in the form of ATP. So in the right hand side over here, here's my ATP molecule. What it will do is it will bind to the protein. When that energy is supplied, look at how the conformation of the protein changes. Now it is open to the outside of the cell. The sodium ions will then leave the channel and they exit to the other side. What is understood and what you can see is there are more sodiums up here. This is the higher concentration. So they just move from low to high. That required energy. As this is actually open to the outside of the cell, potassium ions find the opportunity to enter, to bind to the other side of the protein, and they're going to be moved from low to high. So we can make the assumption that there is a low concentration of potassium and a high concentration inside the cell. This is standard. This is not just there, they want to make outside and inside. It is a known, and you have to know this fact, that there is more sodium out here, less sodium here, and the reverse happens with potassium. There is less potassium here, more potassium here. When the phosphate group is detached, what will happen is this conformation is going to change. So I'm going to fast forward it. There goes the phosphate group unattached. As soon as that unattaches, this molecule changes back to its original conformation. It's like it needs energy to be in that position. To be in this position, it doesn't. So now that it's open, the potassium ions are going to now enter into the cell. So those two potassium ions now were placed into the cell. There's a little mnemonic device that I use um, to help me remember this information, and it's NAOKIN. That's N-A-O-K-I-N. N-A and O stands for sodium out because what happened was this pump pumped sodium out and potassium which is K comes in so that is always how it works via the pump sodium will always be pumped out and there's three of them that get pumped at a time compared to potassium which gets pumped into the cell and there's now only two of them so this will continue look at as it opens a second round happens three sodium bind ATP joins, provides the energy, changes the conformation. Sodium ions are now on the outside of the cell. They just got pumped out. NAO. Potassium now bind. Phosphate group will be removed, and that changes the conformation so that now potassium are pumped into the cell. So we can see here we are moving low to high with the use of energy. This is why it's called active transport. Or this is why this example, anything that is a pump, pump signifies that energy is used. Okay. And our final type of active transport, it's not as apparent that active transport is being used here. Um, it's called endo and exocytosis. Endocytosis is when something is taken into a cell. Endocytosis might be food or something that's very, very large. So it can't fit through the actual even protein channels 
that would go in. It's not obvious. It doesn't really show low to high concentration very, very well with these animations. Um, it also doesn't show that energy is required. But what we have to recognize is that I'm telling you right now, endocytosis and exocytosis are forms of active transport. There would be energy required in order to do this process. So look what happens. The plasma membrane is going to just engulf the food. There are types of endocytosis. We are going to discuss uh, only two of the three. Phagocytosis, pinocytosis are the two that we will discuss. Receptor-mediated endocytosis, a little bit more than what we need to get into. But phagocytosis is when the ingested material is food or large particles. In this example, it's like bacteria. So that's just a large particle um, that has been engulfed by the cell. So look what happens. The membrane literally completely envelops the food and brings it in. If this truly was food, then a lysosome that's out here might fuse with it and then digest whatever was just brought into the cell. And then that all the materials would then be used by the cell. If it's just liquids or sometimes smaller particles, this is an example of pinocytosis. Same idea, it's just what it's actually being brought in. And they just differentiate between what is known. Sometimes they call endocytosis um, specifically, this would be cell eating, and then pinocytosis more cell drinking. So there, go back. Okay, there's our pinocytosis. And that's the type that we're not going to talk about, so I'll fast forward. The final thing is exocytosis. Things that are wasted and I don't need any longer by the cell, what will happen is they are going to be excreted. They're going to be let go. So this vesicle is going to fuse. So look at how it fuses with the cell membrane. And now everything is released. Sometimes it's waste, but then think of it how the cell also makes proteins. And not all proteins are utilized by the same cell that makes them. So you need to go through exocytosis to release just a large par a large protein molecule out of the cell. Okay. All right, so that kind of concludes our little lesson today on some forms of passive transport as well as all the forms of active transport you are required to understand.